may be seated. God bless you. What a great comfort and encouragement that the sovereign God is also the God who knows us. And uh, I am grateful to God for that. I was, uh, we, we will have our time of prayer before we get into God's word. And, and um, I was made, it was made known to me this morning that Bill Johnson went into the hospital last night. So we'll want to remember to pray for him as well. I really don't know anything uh, beyond that. So uh, as we do pray, if you're not familiar with our season of prayer, I will open us. And if you have the name of someone on your heart and mind or uh, situation or circumstance, if you'll just lift that name to the Lord uh, at the appropriate time and uh, would encourage you to join us as we go to God's throne in prayer. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we are grateful that you are all knowing, that you are all powerful, you are all mighty, you are holy, holy, holy. And God, we recognize you as such, and in doing so, God, we are brought to the point and place in our lives that we realize our need for you, and we realize others and their need for you as well. And so, God, we now bow before your holy throne, and we bow in the name of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, who we know sits interceding for us. And so, God, I ask now that as we have come before you, that you will hear our prayers, that you will respond in accordance with your will, and that, God, you will be glorified and honored in all that is said and done. And so now at this time, God, I want to lift up Bill to you and just pray a physical touch upon his body, comfort him. God, draw his heart unto you during this time. Pray your peace upon him and Beverly as she cares for him, in Jesus' name. Dear God in heaven, we also lift before you uh, Dale and Enmi and James and Lori and um, Yvonne and Rick. um, God, those who cannot be with us today for physical reasons, we pray your intervention in their lives physically, but trust most of all your spirits work in their hearts as they go through these seasons of life. Father, I thank you for these that are here today. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. And God, I trust that your Holy Spirit would teach us truth, would lead us, would convict us, would encourage and comfort us in obedience to your word. And God, we trust you for this. And we give you praise and thanks. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Jonah. It's one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament, and if you don't know why it's it's called the minor prophet, talk to somebody who's attending the Bible Academy. They will be able to enlighten you. Uh, 
And also let me encourage you on Sunday mornings at 945, we have Bible study classes as well and would encourage you to get involved with those. It's a great opportunity to look at God's Word and have a, a more intimate, smaller number of, of people involved in each class for the purpose of question and answer and discussion there. As we look at Jonah, I'm certain as soon as you make that connection of the biblical Jonah, there's probably one particular standout point in your mind. Sadly, that one particular standout point in your mind often obscures what we can learn and know about God from the book of Jonah. Because that one point really is only specifically mentioned in one verse of the four chapters of Jonah. And so I'm trusting that God's Spirit today will, as we begin this sermon series through the book of Jonah, help us to see and know what is primary about the book of Jonah and why it's primary and why the book of Jonah is of such an important biblical message and insight into God's character. And so rather than be lost or distracted by a big fish, I trust that the great reveal that we will see from what this book tells us about God and how it connects with what we know of God from the rest of Scripture, that the whole picture would be understood. And sadly, the biggest debate today among those who would call themselves Bible scholars is the place of Jonah in Scripture. And I want you to understand, as we go through some introductory material that we will know and understand why God's Word is God's Word, how God has used, used people throughout history in regards to His Word, and specifically the prophets of God who were called to speak, and as we benefit from, record the Word of God. So join me, if you would, in a word of prayer as we look to this book of Jonah. Dear God in heaven, I again ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us truth. Father, I pray that as we look at background and history, we'll not get lost in details, but we'll be enabled to see the greater picture of how great you are as God. And Father, we're careful to submit ourselves to your word and the truth of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, we sang a song to open our time together this morning, How Great Thou Art. And that's an incredible statement about the greatness of God because the greatness of God is beyond our understanding as human beings. And so that should thrill us that God is so much greater than we can even understand. And the danger that some people face in the way that they approach the book of Jonah lends to questions. What question? Well, some would say, again, these Bible scholars, I use that term loosely in my opinion, these Bible scholars would say Jonah's just an allegorical story or Jonah's just a parable. And I believe you run into true danger when you go down those pathways because then when does that questioning end? When do you stop questioning? Now, there are genres of Scripture. There are different uh, means in which Scripture is written and is best understood. But I present to you today as we look through the introduction in the book of Jonah that we are careful to understand that Jonah is an historical piece of literature that is tied into real people, real events, and places, and it, we see that in the historical setting of the book, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But here's what I want to share with you that would strike me the most about viewing the book of Jonah as biblical history, and that is the references that Jesus Christ himself made to the book of Jonah. And not only the fact that Jesus Christ referenced it more than once, as we have it recorded for us in the New Testament, but the fact that Jesus Christ would reference it in the context to which he was speaking. So listen, if you would, about the witness of Jesus Christ as it's tied directly to Jonah in regards to the ministry of Jesus Christ. 
These passages are on the screen. They're all written for you on the back of your bulletin if you care to take notes. And for the sake of time, I'll read them. But you have the references to go back and read them yourself, and I would encourage you to do so. Beginning in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41, listen to the words of the gospel. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him. They were talking to Jesus, that's the him. Saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But Jesus answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Do you hear the seriousness in which Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders of his day and makes direct reference calling Jonah a prophet? Do you catch that? It would seem hard for me to receive from the words of Christ that he would reference Jonah as a prophet if Jonah wasn't a prophet. Now, I know that may seem like that's not really an issue, but brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are going to continue to stand and live according to the God of Word, can, uh, God, God's Word, certainly you can see as well as I can today that there are those who make that claim, but they're definitely leaving the truth of the Word of God in their proclamation and in their application. So Jesus said Jonah was a prophet. Let me continue reading. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Do you hear that reference? Again, Jesus has called Jonah a prophet, and now Jesus is referencing his death, burial, and resurrection in regards to Jonah. You do understand the seriousness of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And in that seriousness, I cannot bring myself to believe that Jesus would make the comparison to a parable or an allegory, as some would say that the book of Jonah is. So I hope you see this in light of Scripture. Continuing on in the context of Jesus interacting with the religious leader. Jesus went on to say that the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Again, how could Jesus be speaking allegorically when he's talking about final judgment and condemnation for those who do not repent and turn to the Lord? That wouldn't make sense in what's being taught. And Jesus goes on to say, for they, talking about the Ninevites, repented at the preaching of Jonah. Do you see the constant reference by Christ to the reality of Jonah, Jonah's message, Jonah's day and age, and the people who, who as a result of Jonah's message repented? That makes it impossible for me to believe that Jonah was just some mythological story. And so Jesus goes on to say, they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And of course, again, he was referencing himself as he referenced what Jonah went through to the death, burial, and resurrection of himself as our Savior and Lord. Luke 11, Vince read that earlier as we began our time of worship, gives a similar message where Jesus is speaking to the crowds and his emphasis on, is on repentance in the soon-to-be-resurrected Christ. And again, God's judgment, God's eternal judgment being referenced. It seems clear to me that Jesus certainly did not see Jonah as parable or allegory. Frank Page, in his commentary on the book of Jonah, writes, The position affirmed here is that the book of Jonah is a skillfully written narrative recounting a series of actual events from the life of the prophet himself. That's the camp I'm in. <laughs> if you choose to be in a different camp, I think you're leaving the realms and reigns of the totality of God's word as God's word. 
But I want us to see and know the seriousness of Jonah, Jonah's message, Jonah's life experiences, and all that the book of Jonah ultimately reveals to us about God himself. So, the historical setting of Jonah, and we'll continue on. The historical setting of Jonah fits into eight, to the 8th century before Christ. It was a period of incredible changes among numerous significant civilizations in our world. I have some more biblical references because these references tie into that from a world history standpoint, but you can go home and on your own study world history in regards to, say, Egypt. Egypt in the 8th century before Christ was in incredible transition from the 25th dynasty, which would be ruled by the Kushite king Kashta. And it began a whole line of Nubian rulers in Egypt. In the mid-8th century, Greece was colonizing regions around the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. In the mid-8th century, Rome was founded. Rome was founded or is credited to have been founded about 753 before Christ. The Neo-Assyrian Empire. So now we've kind of started on the large world stage historically and we're narrowing it down. The Neo-Assyrian Empire was kind of stumbling early on in the 8th century, but would later reach the peak of its power, which was evidenced in Scripture by the Assyrians conquering the ten northern tribes, as we have recorded in Scripture. Again, the evidence of Scripture is where we need to base our faith and understanding of who God is and what God has done. The evidence of Scripture. Assyria's conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel began approximately at 740 B.C. under King Pul. First, current, First Chronicles 5.26 records, and again, you have this for you printed on the back of your bulletin. You can go read these later, but listen as I read it. Second, First Chronicles 5.26. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, the spirit of Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and he took them, talking about the northern tribes, he took them into exile, namely the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So you can easily parallel world history with what the Scripture is recording about what God is doing. Those were the tribes that were located east of the Jordan River, which was initially those who were conquered by the Assyrians as they begin to sweep through. 20 years later, approximately 722 BC, the capital city of Samaria, which was the capital of the northern tribes, was subdued and overtaken by the Assyrians under Shalmaneser V. And after first forcing tribute, which we have recorded in scripture as well as world history, Shalmaneser later laid siege to the city when it refused to pay. And following a three-year siege, 2 Kings 17, verses 5 and 6 record for us, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried the Israelites away to Assyria. Again, parallel world history with Scripture and what Scripture has recorded for us. And now if you'll open your Bibles to the book of Jonah, if you have not already, you'll notice that Jonah was the son of Amittai, as recorded in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, who came from gath Hefer in Sebulun. And Joshua chapter 19, verses 10 through 13 tell us this. Not only was he one of the earliest prophets of Israel, he was close on the heels of Elisha. And as 2 Kings 14 says, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel. Don't get lost. Which he spoke by his servant Jonah. 
So even the historical annals recorded for us in and among the Israelite people makes reference to Jonah and his prophecy, or being a prophet, I guess I should say. So all of that, and some of you are, oh, we're done with the history. <laughs> okay. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our God is the God of history. And nothing happens in history outside of him knowing and being in charge of it. I trust that we'll see that view. Because all of human history isn't recorded in Scripture, but as I've emphasized already, we can easily line up specifically Old Testament history as well as New Testament history in line with what secular history was recording and has recorded that is undeniable. And so all of that to say that what we know of Jonah is limited. It is limited. Those are basically the references to Jonah outside of the book of Jonah in the Bible. But it is more than enough lined up with secular world history to reveal to us this, these were real people in real time and in real places encountering real events. So, I submit that to you as Jonah's place, not only in Old Testament history, but also in the history of the world, because the biblical picture is clear. And while the bulk of what we know about Jonah is only re really revealed in the four chapters of the book of Jonah, it's still a powerful message. And it's powerful because it's God's man, Jonah, the prophet, recording and speaking on behalf of God himself. And while the historical impact is evident, we must understand the eternal impact, because the eternal impact is still seen today. What's the eternal impact? Jonah's message to the Ninevites is the message that we, as God's people today, need to be proclaiming to the world. Repent and turn to God. That's the message we still need to be proclaiming. It really is that simple. Because God hasn't changed. And God's desire for people to repent and turn to Him has not changed. But I trust that as we look at the picture of God, we'll also learn maybe more insight about ourselves and humanity as a whole because we really see the truth of humanity revealed in the book of Jonah as well. So let's look to God's holy word. Jonah chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. If you're using the chair pocket Bible in front of you, it's on page 920. The rest of you have had plenty of time to thumb through your index or your tabs or realize your last guess was correct when you found the book of Jonah. At least I hope you didn't keep looking after that. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of of the Lord. If you want to underline a portion of Scripture, if you do that kind of thing or highlight it, underline that last phrase. Because at one point or another, and even maybe today, it applies to every one of us in here. <laughs> We've turned away from the presence of the Lord. Notice the clear description of what has happened. We see an obvious portrayal of God. Verified by what we know of God from the rest of Scripture, we really see an incredible description of not only who God is, but just as obvious a description of mankind. God is merciful. Mankind is rebellious. I mean, if I had to summarize, that's the message. God is merciful. Mankind is rebellious. 
I mean, it's, it's right here in the text we just read. God spoke directly to Jonah, and Jonah directly did what? <laughs> Ran away, turned away from the presence of the Lord. So in all your life experiences of turning away from the presence of the Lord, don't feel isolated. Welcome to the planet. But we have it specifically recorded of Jonah. Now, that's where you should trust and be thankful for God's great mercy that he didn't use you as the example. How many of you are glad God hasn't portrayed your life for all of eternity to be recorded and known as the one, even though you were, as the one who turned and ran away from the Lord? Just trying to make everybody feel included here. Because you are, you're a rebel. You're a rebel of God, rebel from God. But I want us to see this key that we see towards the end of the book of Jonah. If you turn over just a page or two, depending on the print in your scripture. This key is found in Jonah 4.11. This is God, and you know, Jonah's having his pity party, and God decides to speak. Pity party. That includes all of us too, by the way. You realize that? We all have our own little pity parties. And in Jonah 4.11, God's responding and said, Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? In other words, God is saying, Jonah, you still haven't learned my heart. My heart is to have mercy and to have compassion on people who don't know me. And the way God has done that from before Christ, through Christ, and since Christ is for God's people to tell other people about how merciful and compassionate God is. That's God's plan. And we see the heart of God, specifically in this context, revealed towards the people of Nineveh. But again, Scripture clearly portrays mankind as well. God sent prophets to his own people all through the Old Testament. And God, as the book of Hebrews says, has spoken once and for all through his son, Jesus Christ. So you don't have to make up a message. You don't have to invent anything for God. Just go tell people what God's already done. And God was instructing Jonah to do just that. Jonah, just go tell them to repent and turn to me. So we see this greatness of God. We see this rebellion of humanity. But I want us to understand that God is merciful. And for that, we should be grateful. We should be grateful. You have rebelled against God. And the Y-O-U in my statement there is second person plural and first person. <laughs> you, you individually, you, all of you. You have rebelled against God. At some point, in some manner, in some way. But we should be grateful that God is merciful. And in God's mercy... He has, and if it's never happened before today, revealing to you His mercy through His Word. That's how great God is. And for God's greatness, we should be grateful. And there really was no way for there to be any misunderstanding between God and Jonah. Although... Although there's still people today who claim to know God, and boy, do they mess up what God really says and means. It's really straightforward. And here's the way it goes. God is merciful. Look, look at the first two verses. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, okay. the text indicates from the original language, that God made this clearly known to Jonah. 
Now, I'm certain we have plenty of parents here who in your attempt to make clear to your children what needs to be made known, there could have been some miscommunication, there could have been some misunderstanding, but if the message was important enough, you made sure they knew. Now, all of us as children, we did our best to reason it away, to justify our lack of obedience. You see God and humanity pictured there? Same thing that's happening today. But God made it clear. And God made it clear, not only because he's a merciful and gracious God, but as verse 2, he told uh, Jonah, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. God is also the judge. And the judge is making certain that those who will stand before him know what's coming. They know what's coming. This is the way Paul put it in Romans chapter 1. There will be no human beings without an excuse in recognizing God. There will be none. But God made it really clear here to Jonah. Jonah, get up and go tell them this. And perhaps even the challenge for some of us today is we see wrongs going unpunished. We see wrongs that deserve justice. Don't give up on God. God is a just judge, and judgment will happen. It's enveloped in his very character. He is a merciful God who grants calls of repentance so that none are without excuse, but he's also the judge to whom those calls of mercy that go out to human beings, human beings will in no way be able to stand before God as the judge. And say, I didn't know. But thankfully, God is merciful enough to call out evil, sin, and godlessness. And offer the opportunity to repent. And that greatness of God is clearly portrayed here. See, the difficulty for Jonah was the Ninevites would have fallen under the category of the Babylonians. They were arch enemies of the Israelites. Jonah probably wanted them to be judged. In fact, he indicates it later on. We'll see that to come. Jonah wanted them to be judged because they were enemies of his. Well, thank the Lord that you don't have any arch enemies because you're not a superhero. But God wants you to know of his mercy and grace and to repent Because God has made it clear, judgment is coming. It's somewhat amazing that as human beings, we still try to run from God after all that history makes known to us. After all that... Did you have the the history teacher in high school who said, we study history so that it won't be repeated or something along those lines? Well, none of us learned history because we keep repeating our rebellion, and running from God. We keep doing it, even as God's people. That's why God sent prophets to his own people, because they kept rebelling and running from him. But here, God is sending Jonah to a whole other group, and yet we still will go to incredible lengths when we are trying to avoid God. I'm, I'm talking you and me now. Jonah did go to some incredible lengths, but boy, so do we. And if it wasn't so tragic, it really would be comical. Because we'll try to avoid anything when we're in rebellion or running from God. Look at verse 3 in the book of Jonah, chapter 1. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, there's a part of us that wants to go, who would be silly enough to try and run from God? Uh, Would you hold up that mirror you have? He rose to flee from the presence of the Lord, and he even found a ship that literally was going in the opposite direction. And not only was he silly enough, he paid to run from God. Let me tell you, running from God is costly. It's costly. He paid the fare, got on the ship, 
And as the last phrase of verse 3 says, to turn away or to go away from the presence of the Lord. Clearly, this reveals Jonah, but as is the emphasis, it reveals every human heart at some point in some time. And I so appreciate what Alistair Begg said in commenting on this. Listen carefully, because again, he, in our modern times, did a great job of summarizing what was taking place. Alistair Begg said this, the devil will always have a way out of town when you're running from the Lord. And Alistair Begg goes on to say, notice the language down to Joppa went below deck and it describes Jonah sinking into the depths of running. Trying to run from God will always be a descending path. I think within a few sentences, he summarized it pretty well. But he goes on to say, great grace is revealed by God to Jonah, and he still didn't see it. Especially when God wanted to show his great grace to the Ninevites. Close quote. What an incredible picture of what's taking place here. And today, I believe from God's word, I trust that we will recognize God's great mercy and grace to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And instead of running, that we would repent and turn to the Lord. I'm talking to two groups of people here today. There's those of you who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And your only hope is to repent from wherever you might be, turn from self, and turn to Jesus Christ. That's your only hope. That was the message that Jonah was taking to the Ninevites. Look, you need to repent and turn to God. It really was a short and simple message. And if you're here today and do not know Jesus Christ personally, that's the call from this text. But sadly, Jonah knew the Lord. Jonah was a prophet of God, and he was still running. I believe that's the greater message for those of us today who know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we still continue to run. We still continue to rebel. We still continue to, in different times, ways, and places of our heart and life, turn away from God. Let me give you the same message. Repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's your only hope of living in peace in regards to your relationship with God the Father. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word that clearly illustrates our need to constantly be repenting and turning to you away from our own willful rebellion. And God, if there be someone here today that does not know you, I trust